June 6th, 1944 is a date that human history will never really forget. The assault on Fortress Europe through the deadly Atlantic Wall was the opening line of the final chapter in what was supposed to be a thousand-year tale. The Greater German Reich and its Führer had once proclaimed to be the master of all they surveyed, a mighty conqueror without equal. Yet even as the swastika still flew over continental Europe, the so-called Aryan supermen and their necrotic empire of genocidal horror was facing their fate at the hands of an even mightier force, a force that no tyrant in history has ever survived, the righteous and unending fury of an army of free men, an army united for a just and noble cause. And if you want to lead your own army, you can do so in today's sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game set during World War II, and you can choose one of the real countries that fought during World War II. You can fight up to 100 other players in real-time games that take weeks to complete, and you can do it with historically accurate units and secret weapons, which you can use to build your army. Tanks, planes, nukes, you name it, you've got it. Declare war on your neighbors or forge an alliance with them. It's up to you, and they're all players. That's right, players. You can choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles, and ultimately take over the world. In fact, my favorite part of this game is the long-term strategy PvP aspect, but then you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile. And if you sign up today, you get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. That's right, for free. The offer is only available for 30 days though, so don't lose time and sign up to Call of War. Anyway, back to the video. By June of 1944, the Allied Air Forces had dealt a significant blow to the Nazi war machine. Though arms and munitions production was managing to increase, the distribution network was in disarray. The constant destruction of major manufacturing facilities forced the German war economy to be highly dispersed, resulting in long supply chains and a much higher drain on resources. Furthermore, due to the excess strain on the rail net caused by this dispersion, actually getting equipment to the troops that needed it took far longer than it should, if it even happened at all, which more often than not, it didn't. And that's before taking into account the transport plan. The concerted effort by Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force to destroy any form of transit available in Germany and the occupied countries, in the lead-up to Operation Overlord. But most importantly of all, though, was the fact that in an effort to defend their factories and rail hubs, the Luftwaffe was forced to engage the Allies head-on, despite being heavily outnumbered and, with the exception of the small number of ME-262s, they were completely outmatched technologically. It also didn't help they were led by an incompetent morphine-addicted blob. And so, the once proud Luftwaffe, the linchpin of the Blitzkrieg, was systematically annihilated until the sky was unquestionably owned by the Allies. However, while all this was devastating to the German war effort, the simple fact of the matter is that air forces can't take ground. They can't change a government or liberate the enslaved. While the damage being done would almost inevitably wear down the Nazis, during that time, millions more would die at their hands. While all available German reserves could be deployed against the Eastern Front, slowing the Red Army's advance to a murderous crawl. Waiting around wasn't an option. The Allies had to open the Second Front as soon as possible. But the great thing about an Air Force is, while they can't take the ground themselves, they're able to bring the men who can. Paratroopers. At the time, they were pioneers, the cutting edge of infantry soldiering. World War II saw the birth of what became the modern special forces we know today, and these men were the genesis. The concept for a parachute assault went back as far as World War I. The Italian army had experimented with parachute infiltration by dropping saboteurs behind enemy lines, but it was the United States Army who developed the first outline for a full-scale airborne operation. At the behest of Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, plans had been drawn up to drop a unit of specially selected men behind the German line in their sector of the front to cut their supply lines and pincer the frontline defences. The operation was set to take place during the Allied Spring Offensive of 1919. However, numerous operational difficulties presented themselves, and as we know, the armistice of November 11th, 1918 put an end to hostilities. But the idea of a highly mobile infantry force, deployable by air, never really went away. The utility of such a unit in future wars was obvious to everyone. It was simply a matter of working out the logistics and refining the technologies required to carry out the operations effectively. 
These naturally developed through the interwar period. Bomber and transport aircraft became significantly larger, making them capable of carrying the necessary payload of men and material, while the invention of the static line parachute system made rapid coordinated mass jumps possible. The static line parachute system, for those who aren't aware, is a parachute with a quick release mechanism hooked up to the wire line inside of an aircraft. When the soldier jumps out, the hook pulls the quick release and deploys the parachute automatically, allowing for a fast and uniform deployment of troops. Now surprisingly enough, the first nation to develop an official organized airborne force was the Soviet Union. Beginning in 1933, the Red Army began conducting exercises involving the mass deployment of paratroopers, their mission being to carry out infantry operations and forward reconnaissance. But they wouldn't be the first to use them in combat. For you see, also in 1933 there had been, uh, shall we say, a slight change in government over in Germany, and the Reichswehr was starting to look at options for modernizing their definitely only 100,000 man strong army. In fact, Germany had been collaborating with the Soviet Union in developing their military capability as far back as the early 20s, but for no apparent reason at all, interest in rearmament had spiked, and so a number of Lufthansa airline pilots, retired army officers and government officials related to the defense ministry, all conveniently happened to start arriving in Russia, completely by coincidence, to watch these exercises, and they were definitely, definitely not carrying out training of their own, with Soviet help. However, one man present wasn't training, because he struggled climbing the short flight of stairs outside his office. Hermann Goering had loudly proclaimed that when he formed his definitely non-existent air force, everything in Germany that flew belonged to him. He was very impressed with the Soviet demonstrations and wanted to form an elite airborne force for the new German Reich. He knew that Hitler, as well as the armed forces, would love the concept of an elite group of soldiers able to drop anywhere and everywhere to seize crucial objectives. Their utility was obvious, as mentioned before. However, to Goering, it was more of an ego trip. Himmler had his Waffen-SS. The army had the Gross Deutschland Division, based out of the Wach Regiment. Hitler had the SS Leibstandarte. Everyone and everyone had their own cadre of household troops. Well everyone and anyone except him. And if there is one thing that Goering could not stand, it was an affront to his ego. I mean, look at the guy. And so he ordered the formation of the Fallschirmjäger, the paratroopers. And because they deployed from aeroplanes, they belonged to the Luftwaffe. These men would form the vanguard of the Nazi conquest of Europe. They led the charge into Scandinavia, seizing vital airfields, allowing the Germans to quickly airlift heavier infantry units into Norway. They captured vital bridges, airfields, and fortifications in the Low Countries during the Blitzkrieg West, the most famous of which being the daring assault on the Belgian fortress of Iban Imail, where a small force of 85 Fallschirmjägers deployed via gliders captured the fort while defeating its garrison of over a thousand men. And it was these same men who almost trapped the entire Allied expeditionary force in Greece by securing the Corinthian Isthmus ahead of the advancing panzers, ensuring the complete conquest of the country. It was evident to everyone. The age of the paratrooper had arrived. Their effectiveness and utility was no longer a theoretical article in an academy journal, but a proven operational fact. The Allies would need their own airborne forces if they were to stand any chance of liberating Europe from Hitler's clutches. And so, at the behest of Winston Churchill, the Parachute Regiment was formed closely followed by the conversion of the 82nd Infantry Division into America's first airborne division. Their war cry all the way, supplanted by a declaration of purpose. Death from above. Things moved very quickly afterwards. Soon multiple units and special operations groups were formed, many of which still live on today. Their names etched into the annals of military legend. Names like the 101st Screaming Eagles and the Special Air Service Regiment. Like their German and Soviet counterparts, their mission was to be the tip of the spear, the first into battle, the guys you call to take an objective or perform a mission that simply no one else can do. But at this point, I want to ask you the audience, where do you find the men for this role? Think about this academically for a second. You're asking a man to strap the equivalent of his body weight to himself because there wasn't going to be a vehicle to carry it or a resupply convoy for support or anything like that. He had to bring literally everything he needs for a week of fighting on his person. 
weapons, ammo, explosives, first aid kit, entrenching tool, and all the supplies necessary to survive behind enemy lines. And that's the next part. You're asking this guy to jump out of a perfectly good aeroplane into the middle of enemy territory, usually in the middle of the night, to take an objective most likely guarded by an enemy force larger than his own, and if anything goes wrong, if the drop isn't carried out properly, if the release force from friendly lines is thrown back, if the enemy knows you're coming or for some reason occupies your landing area, there is almost a 100% chance that you'll be captured or killed. There is a very good reason that paratroopers were paid almost double and only accepted volunteers. Because frankly, only idiots, madmen, or the extremely gung-ho would sign up. And that was exactly what they got. When establishing the special units of World War II, the men the Allies were looking for were a cut above the regular forces. They didn't want the standard citizen soldiers who marched when ordered, fired when ordered, and if necessary, died when ordered. They wanted individuals, men with intelligence and initiative, men able to improvise and act on their own to complete the mission. The commandos and the rangers were known for their adaptability. There was nothing they couldn't handle, no matter how bad it got. The SAS, meanwhile, were known for their maneuverability and their elusiveness. They could get out of trouble as fast as they got into it, and they'd usually cause their fair share of trouble in the process. But the paratroopers? They were chosen and subsequently trained with one quality in mind. Aggression. Of all the units in the Allied Expeditionary Force, the Airborne were trained the hardest. Most of the men who signed up didn't make it through the grueling training regimen, either by washout or injury. Those that remained then had to make it through jump training, which in itself was a brutal process. And at every stage throughout, that instinct of aggression was fostered. You didn't jump from the plane, you threw yourself out. You dived on the enemy without hesitation, knowing you'll be surrounded. You ran everywhere you went at twice the normal pace. Only you had those wings on your chest. Only you were authorized to wear jump boots. Only you got to wear the maroon beret. They were the best of the best, the most dedicated and motivated soldiers in the Allied armies. And when everything went wrong, when the plan went to hell, when it looked like June's summer sun would rise on a disaster, it would be these men who saved D-Day. Amphibious operations are, by their nature, the hardest military operations to carry out, and by extension, the most prone to failure. The reasons are numerous, but it boils down to a few factors. First, every single moving part has to work. You need the Air Force to secure the air above you so the enemy can't blast your landing ships. The Navy has to arrive on time and in the correct location, only to then coordinate the embarking of hundreds of thousands of men into landing craft in pitching seas, and then organize their deployment to shore in massive assault waves, again time to perfection, to ensure that the constant flow of men and equipment for the attack keeps happening. And while all this is happening, warships and close air support need to suppress the shore batteries and coastal defenses so the landing force isn't completely mown down in the water. And if you somehow manage to overcome all of these difficulties, you then have to contend with the fact that your small landing area a couple of miles across is the only terrain you control. Just like when crossing a river or attacking a bridge, a beachhead is a choke point. There is only so much frontline space available, meaning that you are very limited in combat power, while the defenders can engage you from three sides. If the enemy is able to reinforce, pin you down, and then counterattack, there is a good chance they can throw you right back into the sea, and with the element of surprise lost, any further landings at the same location would be damn near suicidal. The solution, therefore, is clear. If you can insert a vanguard force ahead of the beach landings behind enemy lines, they'll be able to prevent enemy reinforcements from opposing the landing force while cutting the defenders off from supply or support, and as an added bonus, force the enemy to defend the beach from two threat axes instead of one. This was the job for the airborne. Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Europe targeting the Normandy region of France, involved what was, at the time, the largest airborne contingent of any military operation in the war so far, and their mission was a vital one. Northern France at the time was a very rural area. The majority of land throughout the Normandy region was farmers' fields, enclosed by exceedingly thick hedgerows in a latticework of small country roads, and endless, and I mean endless, choke points. 
The Bocage, as it was called, was a veritable paradise for the defenders, as it restricted the movement of any armed force to small contingents advancing in column with no room for manoeuvre through dedicated kill zones. However, this was a double-edged sword, as this also restricted the movement of friendly units moving to reinforce the defenders at the front line. And it was this key fact that worked in the attacker's favour. You see, because of the Bocage terrain and the way it had developed in the area throughout the centuries, it meant that there were only one or two main roads throughout an area, with the remainder being small dirt tracks and country roads. And these dirt tracks, as well as the main roads, couldn't intersect because of the dense foliage and spacing of the fields, meaning they all went in the same direction, the nearest big town or village. Almost every road in Normandy converges on a small number of villages and towns, Bayou, saint marie glise Carentan, and Caen being the major ones. However, smaller settlements could be found along the roads in between. If an airborne force was able to capture the road junctures, bridges, and towns behind the invasion beaches, this small number of elite troops could, theoretically, stop the entire Wehrmacht long enough for the Allied Expeditionary Force to get ashore. After which, given the Allied material superiority, the only major risk to the invasion was within the first 24 hours, when not enough combat power was on the beach ready to fight. If they were able to establish a beachhead and begin reinforcing it, there would be no way for the depleted Wehrmacht divisions in the area to throw them back out. However, the Germans knew that too. They had been setting up counter-airborne defences all the way along the Atlantic Wall. They erected large wooden poles throughout ideal glider landing fields, earning them the nickname Rommel's Asparagus, and where possible they blew up dams and dikes to flood the lowlands near the coast completely. These flooded fields were almost impossible to distinguish on aerial recon photos, meaning a significant number of the chosen landing zones for D-Day were almost completely unusable, but the Allies didn't know it. Paratroopers or gliders landing in flooded areas would almost certainly be rendered combat ineffective even if they weren't killed by drowning, and a lot of men would be. It was going to be a tough mission, with the fate of continental Europe at stake. The men of the Airborne had to secure those choke points. If they didn't, the entirety of the Wehrmacht in France could launch a counterattack before the beachheads were secured, and the invasion would end in disaster. As the month of June began, the men of the Allied Expeditionary Forces were confined to base. Briefings started being held, and the men of the Airborne began assembling their gear and reviewing scale models of their objectives. They all knew D-Day was coming. It was simply a matter of when, but none of them were ready for what took place. For as June began, the weather was far worse than expected for that time of year, and the best laid plans of the airborne forces were even then extremely susceptible to the weather. Given that this was a nighttime drop, should adverse conditions be present, the plan would surely go to hell. However, the fact was that these were the best trained men available. Men who were trained to improvise, and when all else fails, find the enemy and kill him. What follows is a collection of stories from the men who jumped into the dark that night, and in doing so, formed the units which are now known as the most terrifying battlefield formation in military history. They go by the name of the Elgops, Little Groups of Paratroopers. Little groups of paratroopers, or LGOPs, are loosely defined as an ad hoc formation of elite infantry comprised of hyper-aggressive 19-year-olds stuck behind enemy lines while suffering from, and I quote, a lack of much-needed adult supervision. Now, of course, the officers and commanders were older men. Hell, the commanding airborne generals themselves jumped in with their divisions on D-Day. Literally, the generals like Maxwell Taylor, Gavin, they actually jumped as well. But as we know... While a man may mature, deep down, every man is still 19, and he will always be 19. And when things go wrong, people always fall back on two things. Their training, and their instincts. On the evening of June 5th, Eisenhower had been grappling with the decision to launch the invasion or postpone it. The RAF's meteorologists had forecasts predicting terrible weather throughout the month of June. However, their weather reports showed that on June 6th, there would be a period of what they termed fair weather, where the invasion would be possible, but it was still far from ideal. Nevertheless, given that they had briefed and equipped everyone, 
Any delay in launching the operation posed a serious risk to operational security. They had had a number of scares already. One poor schoolmaster, Professor Leonard Dorr, got raided by military intelligence after practically all of D-Day's code names Overlord, Utah, Omaha, Neptune, etc. ended up in the Daily Telegraph's crossword puzzle. Mr. Dorr was the newspaper's main contributor to the crossword puzzle for over 20 years, and so there was a massive panic that he was actually a German agent feeding information to the enemy. Of course, it turned out they were suggestions from his students who lived in town next to a massive US Army base, and the kids had just picked interesting words they kept hearing from the senior officers hanging around. After all, kids couldn't be spies, what are they going to say? Faced with the risk of the landings being compromised, and the fact that all of his men, from generals to privates, were eager to get into the fight, and postponing again could damage morale quite badly, Ike decided to give the order. Let's go. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savages. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home front have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage devotion to duty and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. At first, things seemed to be going as planned. The paratroopers, so weighed down with their equipment, had to help each other aboard, but once that was accomplished, the endless waves of transport aircraft took off, formed up, and then proceeded to the objective precisely on schedule. However, once they approached the Contentan Peninsula to the west of Normandy, things started to go awry. After receiving the signal from a submarine transmitting navigation instructions towards the landing zones, the weather along the coast was substantially worse than projected. Several thick cloud banks and the beginnings of a morning fog filled the sky ahead of the formation, with the cloud layer beginning precisely at their altitude. And then it started. German anti-air defences along the coastline began opening up on the transports. Long-range harassing fire at first, but as they got closer, the yellow lines of 20mm and 37mm automatic tracer fire began arcing up at them with alarming intensity. The transport crews instinctively began to take invasive manoeuvres, however it proved to be a disaster as all of a sudden they entered the cloud banks. The entire airborne operation was thrown into utter chaos. The formation disintegrated as each C-47 tried to locate their drop zone, but it would mostly be in vain. The Pathfinders, who had gone ahead in smaller drops earlier that night, had run into the same problem, meaning half of them had landed in completely the wrong place, while the other half had lost their equipment or fallen into a flooded field and fried it. The beacons, radio transmitters, all the best laid plans of the first phase of D-Day were completely shot to hell, and so there was nothing else for it but to get the troops out of the planes. The men of the 82nd and the 101st began jumping into the darkness, only to be scattered all over the region, with some men ending up as far as 20 miles inland. Unit cohesion had practically disintegrated, and the troopers were on their own. Meanwhile, in the British sector, things were only going marginally better. Their glider assaults to take the Orne River bridges had managed to reach their assigned landing zones and they got to work. The Oxen Bucks under Major Howard stormed Pegasus Bridge under a very heavy enemy fire and seized it intact, while the other units in the aptly named Operation Deadstick had similar success. 
But like the Americans, the actual parachute drops went completely haywire. The Canadians hit bad weather and ended up God knows where. All they knew was it wasn't their objective. They had been assigned to a unit of British paratroopers assigned to take out the Merville Battery, the 3rd Parachute Brigade's 9th Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway. And they had their own misdrop problems. The Merville Battery was a key objective, a collection of concrete casemates housing heavy coastal artillery located inland to the east of Sword Beach. This position was reinforced with a defensive garrison, the 716th Static Infantry Division, who had set up machine gun positions, trenches and minefields. If left unchecked, it would lay down hellfire on the landings at Sword Beach, killing hundreds if not thousands of men. It was dangerous enough to assign an entire battalion of paratroopers and a Royal Navy cruiser to its destruction. 620 paratroopers in all were to assemble in their drop zone, complete with heavy assault equipment deployed in gliders to take the battery before the landings began. If they failed to seize the position and deploy flares to signal the Navy offshore, the cruiser HMS Arethusa would blast the position to pieces, along with everyone in it. Unfortunately, when the time came to drop, the entire plan came apart. The Canadians, as stated before, got separated in a cloud bank, while one of the gliders carrying the heavy weapons had lost its towing cable and crashed into the channel, killing everyone aboard. When they finally got over the objective area, the anti-aircraft fire was so thick and the turbulence so bad that every plane Every glider, the whole formation, was swamped with vomit from the men being thrown about. The formation broke apart and overshot the landing zones. When the men jumped, they jumped at different times and places, spanning the entire area of over 50 square miles. Practically no one ended up in their designated area, and instead had to rely on dead reckoning. Something not exactly easy in the morning darkness. Lieutenant Colonel Otway had led his men out of the aircraft, and floated down. He had actually spent the last 10 minutes yelling at the pilots to straighten up and head the right way, but since he was here there was no time so he just opted to work it out on the ground and jumped out. In a weird way he'd actually gotten rather lucky. He had missed his drop zone and assembly area completely but it turned out he had jumped right over one of the key objective landmarks. The local German garrison had a headquarters building set up in an old farmhouse. It was clearly marked on his map and he was now floating down right on top of it. Only too close. He smacked into the side of the building and fell into the backyard. Once down, he was forced to return fire at the occupants, who, understandably startled, now began shooting at him from the windows. It was then two of his comrades joined the firefight, having also landed in the backyard, quickly reinforced by Otway's adjutant, who, in the middle of the battle, smashed down into the greenhouse at the end of the building. With the Germans suppressed and uh, slightly shell-shocked, the little group of paratroopers quickly rallied and withdrew into the darkness. Having recognised the building, Lieutenant Colonel Otway knew exactly where he was, allowing him to head directly to the assembly area for his battalion. However, that was the end of the good news, because when he got there, it was nothing but a disaster. Of the 620 men planned for the assault on the battery, only 110 men had made it to the rendezvous point. And most of those men were the light infantry soldiers with just rifles and stens of machine guns. His heavier glider troops hadn't arrived. He couldn't know that one of the gliders had to abort mission while the other had crashed. They were supposed to be armed to the teeth with a full mortar detachment, combat engineers, Piet anti-tank launchers. They had, they basically had the whole shebang lined up ready to go. And now what they actually had was some Bangalore torpedoes to clear the minefield an odd set of wire cutters, one Bren light machine gun, and one Vickers heavy machine gun, with not enough ammo for either of them. Lieutenant Colonel Otway knew that under his current orders, his forces were not sufficient to take the battery, and that he should redeploy to their secondary objectives. However, the other gliders might show up, or the rest of his battalion could make their way to the rally point, only to find no one there. And there was no guarantee, given how well dug in the guns were, that the Navy could even successfully neutralise the battery, no matter how well they shot, which, given Royal Navy gunnery, even though it's pretty good, it's uh, not exactly the most accurate thing in the world. So, he had a decision to make. He assembled the highest ranking officers present and laid out the situation. He knew that it would most likely be suicidal, but he gave the order to move on the battery immediately. And to his surprise... There was not a single objection or question. The officers present just nodded and gathered their men. The only voice being heard was Otway's second-in-command, who simply said, Very good, sir. 
this group of British paras, missing 80% of their men, most of them having been picked up randomly with half their gear missing, was now going to assault an objective that was essentially a fortress with nothing but small arms, grenades, and raw courage. As they approached the battery, they finally had some good luck. It turned out that the Pathfinders and the advanced teams from the Brigade, who got separated, had also decided to proceed on mission, and they had been cutting the barbed wire while scouting the defences of the battery. The problem was that the Germans had been woken up by the massed formations of aircraft, bombers, and, you know, the sounds of fighting all across Normandy. Shit was going down, so they were all manning their guns on high alert. And it was then that things completely went to hell. The gliders, who hadn't showed up prior, now arrived for the assault, sweeping in over the battery. The paratroopers didn't have the signalling equipment required for their deployment, and so they'd been circling around above the area, waiting. Now that the sun was starting to come up, they had been released by their tow aircraft, and were coming in on their landing zones nearby. The Germans lit them up with 20mm anti-aircraft fire, sending one of the gliders crashing into a heap on the edge of the minefield, which was subsequently riddled with small arms fire. The other gliders waved off to alternate landing sites too far away to reinforce the assault. The problem was, they had now alerted the garrison that something was properly going on. The sentries scanned the perimeter and spotted the paras probing their outer defences. The MG42s opened up immediately, and the fight was now on. Otway assessed his options. He didn't have the men to follow his original plan, nor the equipment. Things were going so badly, the RAF had sent over a hundred bombers who had actually missed their targets on the beaches and bombed the Paris landing zones by mistake. Had their drop actually gone as planned, they would have been blasted by their own air force. One of the Pathfinders had relayed that little piece of information as a bomb flew past him. And now the Germans were steadily gaining fire superiority. They had to make a move. He turned to the Vickers and Bren gun teams. Take out those bloody machine guns! The gunners complied, readily suppressing the machine guns. As this was happening, he gave the signal to attack. The shrill cry of British Army trench whistles rang out as the Bangalore torpedoes went off, clearing two 20-foot paths through the minefield. Before the dust had cleared, the paratroopers were sprinting through the breach towards the concrete casemates, firing their SMGs as they went. Reaching the wire, some of the men laid down over it, acting as footbridges for the men behind, who then jumped into the trenches and began engaging the enemy at close range, some even going hand to hand. But not many of them made it. The ones that did, did what they were trained to do. Each bunker and casemate was cleared one by one with grenades, including white phosphorus. Casualties were very heavy on both sides, but the paratroopers held firm. Despite being outnumbered, under-equipped, and essentially an ad hoc team, they completed their mission. The moment the surviving Germans saw their wing insignia, they began yelling Fallschirmjäger and threw down their weapons. They knew that this was a fight they weren't going to win. With their prisoners secured, the paratroopers began destroying the guns, only to note that with horror, the guns in the battery weren't the monstrous German death machines they had been briefed to expect, but an eclectic collection of smaller captured guns. Nevertheless, they had to be destroyed. Setting the plastic explosive they'd managed to scrounge up in the breaches and barrels of the guns, the paratroopers blew them up, blew them away, fired the flares, and fell back. It was just in time, too. A neighbouring German gun position further back from the beaches had been notified that Merville was overrun and began shelling them relentlessly. But all of that, all of that, amazing though it was, and a number of the men got medals for it, all of that wasn't the amazing part. What was amazing is that after everything that just took place, with half their unit wounded or dead, prisoners to guard, low on ammunition and equipment, Otway rallied his men, set up an aid station, and once he was sure that he had gotten everyone together, established several raiding parties, and headed off to their secondary objectives, which they subsequently achieved as well. Think about that. After going on an assault... That intense, with only a fifth of your men, everything went to hell. You rallied your men and finished your secondary objectives as well. The men of 9th Battalion were complete and utter mad lads. However, they weren't the only men doing absolutely wild stuff that morning. Back in the American sector, north of Carantan, Sergeant Jake McNeese of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne, found himself in a predicament. 
He was a demolitions expert. In fact, he was something of a prodigy in turning big things into lots of very small things. So much so that Colonel Robert Sink, yes, that one, had assigned him a detachment of sappers with the goal of blasting the bridges from saint comte du mont to Carentan. Once that was achieved, he was to capture the main bridge capable of supporting heavy vehicles outside of Carentan itself, and then hold it until relieved. However, if a German panzer division shows up, he has to wait until he is about to be overrun, and then drop the bridge with the enemy on it as he and his men withdraw. But like with everyone else who dropped that night, he had no idea where he was, and what's worse, he was one of the unlucky ones. A considerable number of the US paratroopers who dropped in on D-Day had been equipped with leg bags. Now the leg bag was useful because it allowed a man to carry extra gear into the fight, which he could then strap on the moment he landed safely. The issue was, they hadn't been tested on training jumps, nor were there any regulations about how they should be packed. So naturally, the troops packed their heavier gear, such as their weapons and spare equipment, into the bags to make it easier on themselves when they landed. The issue was, of course, if you attach a heavy object onto the end of a thin line or rope and then subject it to excessive force, the line will snap, taking all of your combat gear with it. Now factor in that the pilots flying the C-47s were mostly new to combat and, generally speaking, scored lower on their flight evaluations in training, as more proficient and experienced aviators were assigned to combat aircraft. When they hit the bad weather along with the anti-aircraft fire, the formation scattered while performing evasive maneuvers, which in turn increased their speed. So when the order to jump was given, they were often moving much faster than they should have been, carrying overweight bags held by too thin a line. The result was, of course, snap. Off they came in the propeller blast, leaving the poor hapless paratrooper quite literally hanging in the breeze with his thing hanging out, and not much else. It was this misfortune that befell Richard Winters, commander of the famous Band of Brothers, and it also befell Sergeant McNeese. In his own words, All I had was 36 pounds of C2, a 1,000 feet of wire, blasting caps, a detonator, and not a single man from my demolitions team. He was on his own. His weapon, ammo, supplies, all of it was buried in a hedge somewhere far out of reach. Then again, he reasoned, I have my explosive with me, so I guess I'm going to do my mission anyway. And so, after getting a rough idea of where he was, somewhere north of St. Mary Glees, he worked out the direction to Carantan and started walking cross-country that away, avoiding the roads to stay covert. After an hour or so, he picked up a machine gunner from the 82nd. He had plenty of ammo, but no machine gun. Wonderful. Given that there wasn't anyone else around, Sergeant McNeese decided, well, given the circumstances, he was going to form his own unit, and a true LGOP was born. The two men kept walking through the dark, sounding their clickers every time they heard a movement, and sure enough, they started assembling more men, including two of his squad members, and even better, they had their weapons. Eventually, the group ran across some casualties who had weapons they uh, no longer needed, which brought the group up to full combat readiness. By 1am, this particular LGOP numbered 13 men armed to the teeth with no officers present and an objective involving explosives. They were, quite possibly, the most dangerous fighting formation in Normandy at the time, a fact that they were about to demonstrate. As they made their way eastwards towards the first bridge, they heard vehicles and took cover. It was a dispatch rider on a motorcycle pulling into the courtyard of a manor house. The paratroopers moved up to get a closer look, only to be greeted by a hub of activity. There were a couple of sentries standing guard at a door of a big building. The lights are on, with people running about inside, and in the courtyard itself were parked several staff cars with pennants on the front. It was a headquarters. The Germans seemed agitated, bordering on panic. Clearly, they weren't handling this situation well, and it was about to get worse. A whole lot worse. Sergeant McNeese, realising they had stumbled across a German headquarters, a rather large one too, full of high-ranking officers, decided that this was an opportunity far too good to pass up. After setting up his machine gun in a base of fire position, watching the front door, he prepped his men for an assault. Once in place, he gave the signal, and the MG opened up, dropping the guards in the first burst. What happened next was the encapsulation of the modern infantry motto for winning a battle. Speed, aggression, and the violence of action. 
McNeese and his men fell on the German headquarters like a ton of bricks. Or, more accurately, a ton of C2 bricks. In his own words again, We just went through them like a bunch of bobcats. The paratroopers stormed the building, running and gunning with SMGs and grenades, killing everyone in their path. Once done, they set some explosives, blasted the place, and then broke contact towards their objective, getting the hell out of Dodge before any reinforcements showed up. By 0300 on June 6th, they were in the clear and approaching the first of their bridges, which in accordance to their mission, they blew up. And then they blew up the next one. And the next one. And the next one. By sunrise, they had reached their main objective and taken the position, rigging the main bridge in Carantan to explode. They would hold the bridge for the next three days against multiple German counterattacks, including a shootout with a German sniper. A shootout which they won, albeit at great cost. Eventually, they would reach D-Day plus four. The sounds of their constant battle with a rather ironic foe, 6th Valshamjäger, based in Carantan, began drawing in more and more of the paratroopers scattered nearby. It was a truly impressive feat of arms, only to be nullified by the Allied Air Forces who, not seeing any identification markers, blasted the bridge to pieces while strafing both sides of the river. By the time it was over, Sergeant McNeese and his men surveyed the situation and figured, well, at least we don't have to worry about counterattacks anymore. So they dug in and awaited reinforcements. But elsewhere on the morning of June 6, 1944, a fellow NCO in the 101st Airborne was doing something even more insane. Just behind Utah Beach near the town of Fukaville, stuff was, as they say, going down. The men of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment had the job of clearing the area to make way for the 4th Infantry Division landing at sunrise. Like everyone else, they had been scattered all over the area and forced to organise themselves with whoever they found, and at the front of one little group of paratroopers was Sergeant Harrison Summers. Summers' unit, 1st of the 502nd, had the objective to seize a vital roadway that ran through a hamlet. The hamlet itself, though, was not big enough to be a village or town, and thus Allied planners had no idea what to name the place. Therefore, they gave it a designation, Complex WXYZ. The rest of the battalion was currently assembling under its commander, Colonel Cassidy. But given that Summers was there and he had a fire team with him, he decided, well, he'll just do the whole mission himself. I've got the men, why not? The compound itself was the barracks for the local garrison as well as the command post, meaning it was full of German troops who were just waking up to what was going on. And so, when Summers and his men moved to take the objective, one hell of a firefight broke out. A firefight so vicious, it was heard at the temporary headquarters set up by the 502nd HQ, who were in the process of organising a force to take the complex. However, that force would not be necessary, because Sergeant Summers decided that since he started the fight, he was going to end it too. Ordering his men to maintain suppressing fire, he broke cover and flanked the first building they were taking fire from. While the enemy were distracted, he kicked in the door behind them and sprayed down four Germans. The rest of the enemy squad fell back to the next building, but not fast enough. By the time they had set up their next defensive position, they were already taking fire from the base of fire element as Sergeant Summers charged towards them. They weren't fast enough. Summers kicked in the door and sprayed down the survivors in a long burst until his weapon went click. Now this is insane enough as it is, but it was then one of his men, Private John Kamen, pulled up alongside him with an M1 carbine locked and loaded. Summers put in a fresh mag in his SMG, and before the rest of the team could catch up, he and Cayman started two men clearing the entire compound, building by building, clearing them of the enemy as they went. Finally, they made it to the second to last building, a large townhouse near the rear of the area. It turned out to be the garrison mess hall, and it was filled with a platoon of wide-eyed Germans who had just sat down to breakfast. None of them could reach their weapons before Summers and Cayman gunned them down. With the mess hall cleared, there was only one building left, the barracks itself, where the majority of the garrison would be waking up to all the gunfire. By now, Summers' men had caught up to him, only to be told they were going to hit the barracks. Unfortunately, it was across an open field with absolutely no cover or concealment. It would have to be a frontal assault done quickly. Summers stood up, yelled, follow me, and charged the building, at which point the Germans opened fire. Several of the paratroopers went down, but the machine gun team managed to suppress the windows long enough 
for the rest of the unit to get to the other side of the field. It was then some of their tracer rounds started a fire in the hay barn next to the barracks building. What they didn't know is that that was the ammo supply point for the garrison. The ammunition immediately started cooking off, which caused the Germans to evacuate the building. Straight into the guns of Summers and his men. They didn't stand a chance. The paratroopers opened up on the fleeing Wehrmacht soldiers, who were cut down mercilessly. It was then that reinforcements began to arrive, equipped with bazookas, who then started sending rockets into the building, starting a fire which soon consumed the entire barracks, along with everyone inside. Estimates vary, but due to Sergeant Summers seizing the initiative, he and his little group of paratroopers accounted for no less than 80 enemy combatants, killed, wounded, or captured, along with the seizure of their objective. He was put in for the Medal of Honor, however it went through as a Distinguished Service Cross. Even so, as far as I'm concerned, it was the most heroic action carried out by an individual paratrooper on D-Day, and it certainly ranks as the most impressive. But it wasn't the most important. The most important action of that early morning darkness was carried out by one First Lieutenant Malcolm D. Brannan of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. He landed near pont le Arbe, which was nowhere near his objective, but at that time he didn't know that. All he knew was, like everyone else, he was totally lost. Nevertheless, he went on a paratrooper collecting spree. Within the first hour, he had managed to put together a makeshift platoon, complete with a second lieutenant as 2IC to back him up. Now with a fighting force assembled, he could go and cause trouble. But first, he needed to find out where the hell he was. So, while they were walking down a road next to a stone wall, he decided to stop at the nearest farmhouse, which, as luck would have it, was just up ahead. Knocking on the door, he greeted the stunned farmer and asked if he could point out on the map exactly where he was. At that moment, his men sounded the alarm and jumped behind the stone wall. A car was coming down the road the other way. Lieutenant Brennan ran back to his men, just in time for him to identify a staff car moving quickly towards them. He wasted no time. Open fire! The paratroopers shredded the car with 30-odd-6 and 45 ACP, killing two of the occupants and sending it crashing into a wall on the other side of the road, while throwing the occupants clean out of the vehicle. Brannon ran over to the wounded officer who had been sitting in the back seat. He was crawling to reach a Luger 9mm pistol laying on the ground in front of him. Brannon didn't hesitate. He finished the officer off and collected the weapon. After inspecting the vehicle, the driver was only lightly wounded so they took him prisoner while the second lieutenant began searching the bodies in the back for intel. It was interesting. One of the dead officers had a very ornate uniform. I, I think he might have been a general. Sure enough, they checked his identity papers. Lieutenant General Wilhelm Falli. The man they had just killed was no less than the commanding officer for the 91st Luftlande Division, the unit responsible for garrisoning the entire area. The units trying to respond to all the chaos transpiring would be without their leader. And given that no less than two headquarters buildings in the area had been hit at around the same time, no one could respond effectively. And that is the magnificence of the Elgops. Because of the ingenuity, aggressiveness and fighting spirit of the airborne soldiers, even in the worst possible situation, they pulled through and carried out their missions. Failing that, they established secondary objectives of their own and did significant damage to the enemy, but most importantly of all, because the operation went wrong and all these men improvised, the Germans had no clear structured plan to track on their maps, nor the senior officers to track them. As far as they knew, the entire battlefield was just filled with paratroopers with no clear objectives. So where do they dispatch a counterattack? Where do they reinforce? Where's their commanding officer? in a twist that is testament to their character. Because the situation went so catastrophically wrong, the paratroopers turned it into the ultimate advantage. When the main invasion force hit the beaches, there were no reinforcements coming, no armoured counterattack. The enemy was in complete disarray, their lines of supply cut, their communications non-existent. Despite everything going wrong, despite overwhelming odds, Despite being outnumbered and outgunned even to the point of just their knives, the little groups of paratroopers completed their mission regardless, leaving a legacy to this very day, both in the history of warfare 
and in the freedom that we enjoy. Because it was these men who led the way. And it was these men who saved D-Day. Again, a big thank you to Call of War for sponsoring this video. Just click the link in the description, follow the prompts, and sign up to get some free goodies courtesy of your boy here. Tell the Manamaki sent you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.